Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome a good friend from Tel Aviv, Israel, Dr. Mel Rosenberg to the show. Mel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ashutosh. It's great to be here. Thank you. Mel is a professor of engineering at the Shankar College. He teaches success skills of the digital future. He is a professor of microbiology at the Tel Aviv University, where he teaches music. He's an inventor. He's a public speaker. He's a musician. He's a writer of children's books, and he's the founder of ourbooks.com, which is a self-publishing platform. My God, Mel, what an incredible career you've had so far. So tell me, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or your career? Um, well, I thought about that. Um, shall I call you Ash? Call me Ash. Okay, I yeah. love calling you Ash. So um, I, I think that the milestones happened when I was five years old. Okay. I, I gave it some thought. When I was five, uh, I learned several things in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. it, these were difficult lessons. Uh, because I was left-handed in an era mm -hmm. where being left-handed was still considered sinister. Correct. Um, sinister being the Latin word for left-handed. Mm -hmm. I don't know how oh, it was in India. Mm -hmm. It was the same. In and Canada, any child who was left-handed, the parents would try and correct it. Yeah. So my parents, of course, were okay with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, at kindergarten, they spent every morning taking my crayon from my left hand to my right hand and mm -hmm. I would move back and they would tie me up and punish me and I would still write with my left hand. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was the first lesson. I, I get back to that. Mm -hmm. um, and the second was that I was Jewish mm -hmm. in a very Christian city. Okay. And we had to pray to Jesus every day. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wasn't supposed to pray to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We had to close our eyes and I, I figured, okay, if you're Jewish, and why are you closing your eyes? Mm -hmm. I mean, if Jesus is there in the room, I'm going to see him, right? Mm -hmm. And Correct. then, and there's no point in being Jewish after you've seen Jesus, right? Correct. So, the, the teacher told us that if we opened our eyes during prayer, we would be punished. Okay. Which I was being punished anyway for being left-handed, right? <laughs> so I opened my eyes. Right. And there was no Jesus, but my teacher was looking at me. And wow. so, of course, I was punished. So I think the answer is I learned at the age of five right. that you can respect authority or not mm -hmm. because they can punish you. Mm -hmm. But just because somebody is a teacher does not mean that they are right. And I think that this these lessons were the ones that changed my life at the age of five. Wow. And, and, and the other thing that they made me do, and perhaps this is the reason that I write for children, mm -hmm. is that I realized that I would have to protect myself against education. Okay. I became an educator, but I'm what my brother-in-law calls an anti-academic in academia. Wow. Very interesting. So, Mel, tell me, you know, you're a microbiologist. You do so many interesting things. You're an inventor. I think you've, you've patents registered in your name. You know, you're a professor of engineering where you teach success skills. How do you manage such a diverse set of uh, activities? I'm just busy, you know. I think that being busy keeps me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. I've never been diagnosed because back in the 1950s, there was no such thing as ADD and ADHD. Okay. But I, I'm quite sure that if I were diagnosed, I would be right there on the scale. Okay. Um, uh, in grade one, Ash, in the Hebrew class, I used to walk around the room during the class. Okay. And the teacher had the sense not to force me to sit down. Mm -hmm. So I've always been walking. I, it, peripatetic is, is my nature. Okay. So uh, when I'm doing something, I'm happy and I'm out of trouble. Wonderful. When I'm not doing anything, that's when I get into trouble. Wow. So, you know, out of all the things that you do, what are you most passionate about and why? Okay. 
So uh, people say to me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you, what you're a scientist and you're also a writer and musician. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that it, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer and musician who made a living being a scientist okay. and inventor. And that was really good mm -hmm. for 30 years. But then, you know, and I don't have to tell you, life catches up with you at some Correct. age. Correct. And it caught up with me at 40. Mm -hmm. And then I started to say, okay, you know, life is short. And, and, and why, why do things that aren't you? So I was a pretty good scientist and I was a successful inventor. But Mel Me is funny Mel, children book Mel, a jazz music Mel. Not and, 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 and the You Got Mel. And you've got Mel, yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and you, you were an esteemed guest on Correct. my uh, video blog. No, thank you. Okay. So, you know, uh, when, when you talk about passion and, you know, as I was reading about you, writing books for children, and you just mentioned you wanted to give life lessons to children as well. But then, you know, when I read more about you, you formed the International Society for Breath Odor Research, which I presume was your scientist hat that you were wearing. And you created some amazing things for breath odor. So let's talk a little bit about bad breath. What causes bad breath and how can this be corrected? Okay. So like many things, I got involved in bad breath research mm -hmm. by accident. Okay. We invented the two-phase mouthwash. Mm -hmm. 1980s right. by accident and um, I went we went to a pharmaceutical company much like the ones that you uh, develop and uh, and they said to me uh, does this formula work for bad breath mm -hmm. and I said I don't know how do you measure bad breath so I went to the library and uh, to my surprise there weren't that many academic publications so I came home that evening and I said to my wife, I have found my career. It's a gold mine, but it's a very smelly one. So uh, I ended up spending about 30 years studying bad breath. Wow. Um, and uh, it's caused mostly by a bacteria on the very back of the tongue. Mm -hmm. Not here, but way back. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps because they break down post-nasal drip and other things that we eat that stick on our tongue and uh, epithelial cells. And I think this is the major cause for bad breath. Okay. So it's, you know, we used to have an old grandmother's uh, tale here, which said that if, if you've got bad breath, you're not eating right and you've got digestion problems. What are your thoughts? Well, that's never been substantiated, really. Um, but if you don't eat, you do get bad breath. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that Joseph Tonsitz showed in the 1970s mm -hmm. is that just by eating some breakfast, the volatile organic compounds, the sulfur compounds, go down by about 70% just by eating something. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one cure for bad breath is just to have a good breakfast. That's and true. if you're fasting, then you probably will get bad breath because nothing cleans the back of the tongue mm. like food. Correct. Correct. Well said. And, uh, you know, when you talk of bad breath, I mean, there are so many people who have bad breath and a lot of them don't realize it till they are told. But what is the, what is the answer to managing your breath? Uh, because, you know, it's a very, very societal problem. So that's a great question because I have a book mm -hmm. that uh, anybody can buy for, I think, $5 or something. So tell me about the book. Okay, so uh, I, the name of the book is, I think, Save Your Breath or something. Uh -huh. um, and it deals mainly with this question. Okay. The best way to find out whether you have bad breath or not is not to go to a dentist or a doctor. It's to ask somebody in your family not a young kid but an a, a, a adult child mm -hmm. a sibling your spouse mm -hmm. and hope that they will tell you the truth okay and if you do have bad breath 
then um, you, ha you should ask that person, you might call the confidant, mm -hmm. uh, confidant uh, whether the odor is coming from your mouth or your nose. I see. And that is the simplest diagnosis. But as you, as you implied, mm -hmm. the most difficult thing is getting a straight answer. Correct. Because it's such, a, it's such an embarrassing problem. Correct. Correct. You know, I, I used to have some, a colleague who used to have terrible bad breath. You know, I, someone who used to work with me. And, uh, everyone I would notice would, you know, they'd go near him and turn their head and talk to him. Then one day I called him to my room and I said, have you noticed nobody talks to you directly? And he says, sir, I can't understand what's the reason. He says, I told him, I said, that's because you have bad breath. Now, because I was older and senior, I could say that I got away with it. But he's always thanked me for that <laughs> one comment. Yes, I also have one person hmm. that thanks me every time that they see me. Hmm. But uh, most people whom you tell uh, will either resent you or fire you. Correct. Uh, so I always say you have a you, you must tell people in your family. Correct. If there is someone in your family with bad breath, you have to tell them. Hmm. Like you say, it can ruin their entire life. Correct. They won't have customers. They won't get advanced. Uh, so because nobody else is going to tell them, you have to do the job. Very true. So Mel, let's talk a little bit about Israel now. You know, um, let's talk of talk about entrepreneurship in Israel. And, you know, you've done so many startups and you're continuing to do so many amazing things. What makes Israel such an incredible cradle for innovation and research? Um, I think, that, well, there's many reasons and books written about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the startup nation, um, the army, the fact that we're always in danger, mm -hmm. uh, that we have limited resources. Um, but I think that it boils down to two things. The first is chutzpah, mm -hmm. which is hard to translate into English. Uh, it's like cheeky, being cheeky, mm -hmm. irreverent, irreverent. Uh, that's the first thing. So um, Israelis, uh, and one of the reasons I love living here, Ash, is because they don't, they don't like authority. Okay. They don't like being told what to do. Which, okay. which can be very good, not in this COVID era, uh, because we have a lot of rebellious people like everywhere, but um, it's, it's good for innovation where a professor tells you something, you know, that the, the two and two equals four, and you figure out that two plus two is also equal to 11. Uh, so in many countries, you cannot mention that to your professor, but here in Israel, you can. Nobody calls me Dr. Rosenberg or Professor Rosenberg. If they're nice, they call me Mel. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So there's less hierarchy here. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, I guess that's important. But I'm going to venture that there's another reason. And I call this the coffee house um, mentality. Israel is a coffee house country. Okay. This, this kills me, you know, the fact that we can't sit in coffee houses. Um, this is where we do our meetings. Okay. You know, we don't. We have nice weather. We don't meet in in, in, in offices. We meet in a coffee house near our um, near our office or our, our homes. And you know, you sit in a coffee house, and we're very um, friendly people, Middle Eastern. Uh, and I think maybe that's one reason that we get along so well with Indians, uh, that we are very warm people. Correct. And. Um, and, and uh, you sit in a coffee house and somebody at the other table is talking about something and you know the answer. So in Canada, you wouldn't turn your head and say, oh, excuse me for barging in on you. You wouldn't think of doing that, right? I see. Um, but in Israel, you say, excuse me, but I know the equation that you need. Mm -hmm. I know the physician you have to speak to. Mm -hmm. um, I know the software that you need to download. Um, so this is something very... We have a in very informal culture. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people help a lot of people here. And I think that these are very important reasons that are sometimes overlooked. Wonderful. So, you know, what? one thing that resonated with, with me when you said that, you know, people in Israel don't like to be told what to do. I said, it's almost like the Indians. Indians don't like to be told what they do, which is why everyone seems to be doing their own thing. But... That's fantastic. And I've spent some amazing time in, in your country and 
spent two weeks just traveling and getting to know so many lovely people well, and I, places. I can't, I can't wait to meet you. You know, I'm a little upset that we that our paths didn't cross. But thank you, Odette de Dorley, for introducing us. I agree. Otherwise, we might never. I we might may never not have met. met. I agree. I agree with you. So you know, uh, let's talk about uh, Israel-India relationships. You know, I know. A lot of young Israelis come to India after they finish their, you know, army training, and they come here and they spend time here. Indians have not yet started because we've just started direct flights between Israel and India. But what do you think uh, the Israelis see in India, and what makes them come in such large numbers to this country? You know, I, I've only been in India for an hour, so I'm not the right person to ask. Okay. If you ask the young people, mm -hmm. um, they they feel at home in India. Mm -hmm. I, you know, to come to a, a, a country which has such a different, rich culture and thousands of years old culture, mm -hmm. and and to feel so at home, I think that I think that um, from what I understand from young people, it's a country of hospitality. Correct. Uh, and it's a country where um, no matter how little you have, mm. you share. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you know, you asked me before, uh, I think that the relations between Israel and India are going to grow Absolutely. because we're very, we're very similar uh, in so many ways. Correct. And um, I, I would venture to say that the only issue, that, you know, we're a country of 8 million people and we have a lot of difficulties because, you know, cheekiness and irreverence can only get you so far when the country grows. Correct. It's good when you have 50 people. It's great <laughs> when you have 100 people. And it's okay when you have 8 million. But, you know, you guys have, I don't know. 1.3 billion. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and who's counting? Um, <laughs> so I think that part of the issue uh, is that um, this kind of culture that you have. Correct. Right? It breaks down. Because, like you say, you know, um, there's another country that we won't mention um, mm. that has over a billion people, mm. uh, but it's very authoritarian. Correct. Correct. And the people are used to following orders. Correct. Uh, India and Israel are used to not following <laughs> orders. I agree. I agree. So I've got one more question for you on, uh, you know, on Israel before I come to some questions for you personally. And this question relates to millennials. This, the whole world now belongs to the millennials, you know, they are taking over the world. And I find what an incredible young group of people they are and how different they are from certainly from people of my vintage, possibly yours as well. What are your thoughts on how millennials are going to change Israel? Oh, I, I think it's happening already, Ash. Um, I think that it, it began about six years ago. Mm -hmm when young people started occupying uh, you know, boulevards and parks. So I, I, I think that, that millennials um, see the transparency of the old people, the transparency of the government. Uh, they have a, a global view, which we never had. And they're communicating with people from all over the world. And you know, like the old movie, we're not going to take it anymore. Mm. Uh, I think that they are going to become a wonderful a voice. And maybe they are becoming. You know, we have demonstrations every week here. And um, they're fed up with the government, and rightly so. Um, and more and more of them are voting. Wonderful. Wonderful. But, so let's you know, our labor, our, what's that? our labor party was the major party. It was like the when I came, it was like the Soviet party. Mm. When I came to Israel 51 years ago, mm. they predicted in the next election they won't have even one seat. Wow. In wow. That's amazing. Sorry. That's amazing. So let me move to some questions for you personally. Uh, Mel, so many things you've done, you've achieved so much, and there's so much more to look forward to. What does success mean to Mel Rosenberg? Um, I think that that is a question that I will die without knowing or understanding fully. Okay. Okay. I think that success. Okay, I, I will tell you a story. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hate flying. Mm -hmm. I 
fly all over the place, but I hate flying. I'm afraid mm. to fly. Okay. Um, but but one thing I do, Ash, when I'm on the plane and the plane is taken off, mm. and there's nothing for me to do except have another gin and tonic mm. and sit back, I go to the bathroom and I look at myself in the mirror for a minute and I smile. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is this is the, the, the moment where you are able to do something in your life okay. that, that matters, but that matters to you so that you can get up and look at yourself in the mirror okay. and say, there's a lot of work to be done, mm -hmm. but good job. Okay. The other answer, uh, which I want to share with you, mm -hmm. is it came uh, a week after I interviewed you. Mm -hmm. I interviewed a, a writer named Julie Headland. Mm -hmm. We talked about the difference between being here and being there. Okay. So, um, you know, we're always here. I'm here now. I've written X books, but I want to write more books. So mm -hmm. I'm here. I have to get there. Um, I sold 10,000 copies of my book, but, but Peter sold 20,000. Mm -hmm. I'm here. I want to be there. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I've learned now, and I'm maybe this is something that is part of your culture, mm -hmm. uh, but was never part of mine, is being there. Okay. In other words, my challenge is waking up in the morning and not being here and saying, oh, I'm frustrated, I don't have an agent in New York, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a traditional publisher, um, but to look in the mirror and say, you're there. Mm -hmm. You've done this and this and this and this and this. Correct. Okay, but maybe there's another there that you want to get to. Mm -hmm. But you're not here, you are there. Um, so like for the la last two weeks, I've been a very happy person. Fantastic. I wake up in the morning and I look uh -huh. in the mirror and I say, hey, you're there, you've done a lot of things. Great. Yeah, there's another there. But if you always look at yourself as being here and not there, mm -hmm. there's a there you have to go to, then it's hard to feel successful. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking, I'm here, yeah, you are there could be an incredible topic for a book. So, amazing. Maybe Thank we should, you. We should write it together, maybe. Let's think about it. Why not? Let's think about it. So, I've got time for two more questions for you. You know, my next question is that if you were a role model to millions of children, and you write a lot of books for children, and these children closely followed you and your life choices, what is the one thing you would change in yourself? Uh, okay, so um, I, I looked at that question. Uh, I really can't answer it. You know, um, okay. when, when we were growing up, mm -hmm. there was a famous singer called Judy Collins. Yeah. And she's still well and she's still uh, singing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I teach courses in, in, in popular music. So I reached out to her about six years ago. And I said, Judy, would you give me a message to share with my students from the 60s? And she wrote me a few beautiful lines. Okay. And the most beautiful thing she said was, look back, but don't stare. Ah, okay. So I, I think the answer is, yeah, sure, there's a lot of things I would change about myself. Hmm. Um, I would be a better listener. Um, I would uh, um, have been a better student in college. Hmm. But... You see, but all these things are not me. Okay. So anything that takes you out of being you mm. is a bit of a tricky thing. Mm. I mean, you, you at, at any time in your life, you want to look back, mm. to learn, but not to stare. Mm. Not to say, oh, what would have happened if I stayed in Canada? What would have happened if I studied chemical engineering? Correct. I don't think that this is, is helpful. Mm. Um, I think that the lesson is I'm here today, I'm, I'm there today, <laughs> um, what can I do that was better than yesterday? Terrific, terrific. Mel, thank you so much. It's been such an honor and a pleasure speaking to you and I wish you and everything that you do lots of success. And Ash, same to you. I, you know, once in a while you uh, meet an incredible uh, person. Uh, and you are one of my uh, my finds over the past years, and I can't wait until we actually can sit and uh, share a coffee together uh, there in Israel or there in, in India. India. Yeah, I look forward to that, and the feeling is mutual.
Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.